for the non-Korean speaker. <laughs> no, uh, this is uh, Language Technology and the Sharing Economy. Uh, I'm Joseph Wojcicki. I'm the Director of Operations for Foreign Credits and the Vice President of the Midwest Association of Translators and Interpreters. Um, you can get my slides on my website, and they're also available on SlideShare. Um, so we're going to start with discussing what is the sharing economy. The most frequently recognizable, easily recognizable examples are crowdfunding like Kickstarter, uh, ride sharing like Uber and Lyft, and uh, accommodations like Airbnb. Um, the, when we talk about this sharing economy with regard to technology, it's cloud computing, new project, open source software, volunteer computing, copy left, and open content. Uh, let's see. So let's uh, go into the bulk of the presentation. I'm gonna, actually gonna start this off with a list of assumptions, um, just to kind of start from common ground. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, I come from a standpoint of if a device is internet connected, it is vulnerable. Vulnerable meaning it can compromise data uh, security. Uh, contact with peripherals have been, uh, that have been connected to the internet are also vulnerable. This would be like the, data, the hack of the Iranian nuclear power plant in 2014. Uh, that was not connected, those computers were not connected to the internet, but a USB thumb drive was what broke into it. And also cloud storage still involves storing data in a physical location somewhere. It's not actually in some cloud passing by. Okay. Also, uh, we, this is also on the assumption that you have an idea of uh, the PRISM government surveillance program uh, that data given to Microsoft, Google, Yahoo, Apple is, can also be given to the United States government and stored on their servers, which would also make it a very good target for hackers. And finally, for assumptions, um, all hackers need is a desire to break into something in time, and they'll succeed. Uh, if you go to Inter Information is Beautiful, they have a wonderful interactive infographic that shows the biggest data breaches since 2004. Um, you might want to look at that and then maybe take a sleeping pill because you're going to have a hard time sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, if you want later, kind of come up to me, I will buy you sleeping pills if you need. Um, and so ways that we share information and risk data security. Uh, this would be in our emails. So if you use a Google Gmail account or Yahoo, other webmail formats, um, know that Google saves those. And not only do they save it in Mountain View, they also save it at each intermediary server location that the email goes through. This can also be in public cloud storage. This would be like Amazon, this is OneDrive, Google Drive, iCloud, all of these places are um, potential risks for being hacked. Um, specifically for the translation industry, this would be like TM selling, which is where companies will buy TMs from translators, where the translators might not have the rights to do so. This would be in-browser machine translation interfaces, Google Translate, Microsoft Translator, and MT application program interfaces, or APIs, uh, that go into work with the CAT tool that uh, Translate provider might be using. Um, so let's start with something I did over the summer. And that was read through the terms and conditions of Google. Now, Google has one terms and conditions statement for all Google services. And in the section, your content and our services, you retain ownership of any intellectual property rights that you hold in that content. In short, what belongs to you stays yours. Sounds great, right? All right. However, the next paragraph says, when you upload, submit, store, send, or receive content 
you give Google the license, the worldwide license to use, host, store, reproduce, modify, create, derivative works, communicate, publish, publicly perform, publicly display, and distribute. So coming January 2017, Google the musical. You gave us the rights to perform this publicly, so we figured, why the heck not? And you also, the rights you grant, uh, the rights you grant in this license are for the limited purpose of operating, promoting, and improving our services to develop new ones. Uh, keep this in mind. This might come up later, and why this might be an issue. Uh, so let's try. Let's go to Microsoft. Maybe Microsoft Translator has something better. Microsoft has a specific terms and conditions statement or service agreement uh, for the tr their Translator service. And the way that Microsoft words this is: Microsoft does not claim ownership of the content you or your customers submitted to the service. Your content remains your content. And Microsoft does not control, verify, or endorse the content that you, your customers, or others submit to the service. So Microsoft's statement is a bit more self-restrictive. They have a better idea of what we're looking for in data ownership, and how we define data ownership. However, <laughs> if your subscription uh, expires or is suspended, canceled or terminated, all content submitted, to, submitted pursuant to that subscription may be permanently deleted or irretrievable from Microsoft servers. Microsoft has no obligation to return such content to you. So they could delete it, or they might just hold on to it. I don't know. They might not even do that. Hold on to it forever. However, the way it's worded, they can. Um, when you look into their API. Um, Microsoft cl collects with their translator uh, no more than 10% of randomly selected non-consecutive sentences from submitted text. So in content of 100 sentences, they'll collect 10, but and they're not going to be next to each other. Sentences used are deleted within 48 hours after they are no longer required to provide the translation. If services are rendered through the Translator API, you can opt out of logging by purchasing a subscription of 250 million characters or more. So that's kind of positive. They can log and monitor the stuff that you send to them. However, they can also, you can also opt out of that logging. They won't record anything. However, the 250 million character level is $2,055. Uh, can you raise your hand if you've got an extra 2,000 bucks? No? Um, so in a hypothetical scenario, if every word equal was 50 characters long, 5 million words per month would need to be translated in a month of 31 days, work month of 31 days. And a post editor would have to process 161,290 words per day, every day. So, if a project manager figures in about 6,000 words per day for an editor, editing a human translation, you would essentially have to translate, you would have to edit more words in a day than you could in a month. Because what was it? it turns out to about 186,000 words per month for an editor, just editing. Um, and then they also have the hub service, which uh, allows the translator to create their own sort of vertical machine translation engine based off of their own work and their style. And uh, but the hub, the documents are stored in full to provide the personalized translation system and to improve the translator service. After a document is removed, Microsoft may continue to use it to improve the translator service. So this actually goes away from the 10% non-consecutive sentences rule. Um, and again, hey, you can opt out by, of logging by uh, subscribing to the 250 million character uh, per month level. So. Um, that is how the terms and conditions kind of are stated and worded. I'm just going to present it as that. 
Uh, let's move on to another place where we can we find ourselves vulnerable, and that would be in cloud servers. So, if you look, imagine your data that you have. You store it in a personal lockbox, a strong box. Uh, this could have your photos and videos in it. This could have documents. Could it have your project files? Maybe your project resources, translation memories, glossaries, reference documents, etc. When you put your take your data and put it on a public server, you're basically purchasing uh, a partition of a larger server. But with services like OneDrive, Dropbox, all of these, it's kind of like taking your box and putting it in the town square with everyone else's boxes. Um, and a company's, uh, the, the company's terms and conditions still apply. So storing anything in Google Drive, for example, permits Google to use it as they see fit to advance their own corporate ends. Um, so cloud servers, though, are, there are some pros and cons. There's, it's convenient. You can, it's multi-platform. You can do it on a Windows computer. You can work it on a Mac. You can even access it from your phone, tablet, anything. Uh, there's initial no to low cost. You can get up to 15 gigabytes on Dropbox for free. And there's enhanced security from physical threats like fire, theft, natural disaster, etc. Cons with cloud servers though is that larger files take up bandwidth. And if you're working with your mobile phone, it would be your data plan. Privacy, it's potentially uh, vulnerable to hackers and governments uh, may access your data. And as storage need grows, so do costs. So, and while you only your username and password will open your lockbox, in being continuously connected to the internet, your server partition can be hacked, and it has happened before, like with the iCloud hack of celebrities' personal photos. Um, so, so, cloud solutions for the paranoid. Uh, my preferred method of doing cloud storage is my own self-hosted cloud. Uh, this can be done with programs like Arc OS or Tornado. Uh, there are commercial personal cloud devices where I think Western Digital, for example, offers a, pers a contained box where you can have the same cloud server uh, abilities. But keep in mind that anything connected to the internet is vulnerable. With personal cloud hosting, you remove your data from a larger servers that uh, are a better target for hackers. And with self-hosted cloud solutions, you control when the cloud is connected and available. When I turn my cloud server off, no one can touch it. Even if I were to get hacked, if my computer, if my server is off, it's safe. Um, now. My personal, my personal self-hosted cloud solution normally resides on a box like this. Anyone know what this is? It's a Raspberry Pi. It's $35, and with a, an external hard drive with its own power source, it can work as a cloud server. I can actually store my information on there. I don't have to be present, and it can back up my computers and everything else. Um, with that, I, I can actually just set it in the closet and forget about it. And if I want to take it down, I just unplug it. Um, essentially, you can do this all for under 100 bucks if you need the entire setup, um, which is a better option. And the great thing is that with my server, I can send someone a link to download the file, I can send them, I can create a username for them and give them a password, giving that by other means. I'm not going to send the link and the password in the same email or to the C with the same email account or by email at all. <laughs> but um, but with that, I can do that. It's all secure. It's encrypted, and I don't have to worry about someone opening it that may not have the rights to. And even then, I'm going to send them a sec uh, secured 
zip file instead of a regular zip. And I'll talk about that in a second. So, what are some ways that we can discuss data security with our clients? Um, clients for clients that use machine translation engines, discuss Google and Microsoft logging. Go back, it, take the time. You can use keywords from this presentation to look up the exact sections in the terms and conditions. Read what they say, and those are always changing too. Um, tell them that hey. If you're a law office, do you want to have your client's information on there? Do you want Google to know what this person did or stated that they did? If it's medical, do you want them to know their health history? Anything like that? Um, and then the, 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 use, the, uh, use the links, like Tonito links that I can send people. And then the .izd file, which is an encrypted password protected zip file. Um, but you, it's important to become familiar with the risks inherent with using different services and become familiar with password protecting and password security. Um, the, the thing is that when most websites have characters, like eight character case sensitive alphanumeric passwords, that leads to 62 to the eighth power possible permutations. With five-year-old software for, on a personal computer you can get off the shelf, it would take about 22 hours to, to brute force hack that one, to crack. Uh, with a 25-character case-sensitive alphanumeric password, it's 62 to the 25th power possible permutation, so 645 quadrillion. And for the world's fastest supercomputer, it would take about, hmm, 614 quintillion years to crack. And even if you drop that down by 10, if you had a password that was 15 characters, it would still take, it would take 267 days, but that's still under a year. With a 25 character password, you, it would take more than a lifetime, at least with the current computing power. Um, so, taking all that into consideration, with everything that you, give, you can give to Google or Microsoft or Amazon or Dropbox. Also keep in mind that you also have with your clients non-disclosure agreements. And in working with and operating with them, you have agreed to not disclose any of the information to a third party, which these are third parties. Um, it's not necessarily ours to give because even then it belongs to the translation company, the LSP, or it belongs to the end client. Most of the time it's the end client. Um, that's actually all I have. I wanted to keep it short. Uh, does anyone have any questions though? Yes? Um, on the SDL language cloud, mm -hmm. it talks about that it doesn't um, store anything, it doesn't share anything. Yeah, and I went to, I actually talked to some SDL people at, oh, so it was about SDL Language Cloud and about their, because they say that it's encrypted, it's secure for confidentiality, everything like that. Um, I talked and asked SDL about that at a roadshow in Chicago. And they said that all of their engines are trained from data given to them by their clients, which put up a red, big red flag in my head, do those end clients know that they're doing that? It's not so much a concern for us as it is for the end clients of SDL. Um, yeah. If we're, if we're using it, yeah, it's better than others. But keep in mind that Google and Microsoft Translate, Google Translate and Microsoft Translator are the most are the most frequently used engines, and currently they are the best because they are the most frequently used. Google has Google Translate has been active for ten years now. It's got ten years of data that people have been putting into it. Most of it from students, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.
Oh, sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. sorry. Is this working? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Because um, I've used Google Transit in the past, and it's a disaster. I mean, I, you know, I said let's get started. They said let's get it on. And it always depends on what your language pick up. Spanish. Okay. Is Spanish? And how long ago was that? <laughs> well, that is a fair point. It was two years ago, so I guess it's important. Because it's, it's gotten a lot better. And while it's not going to be perfect in its current state with deep neural machine translation, it's going to. And you're still giving that information to Google. So um, your recommendation is to figure out how to protect yourself against Google because that's currently the best on the market. <laughs> because that's the thing. It's, it's a double-edged sword. You've got the strongest and best engines currently, and you've also got your, your worries for data security. Um, it's either use it or don't use it. I'm not going to draw conclusions, though. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Yes? When, when you were describing the user agreement for Google, uh, Drive, Gmail, etc., mm -hmm. uh, does that, I assume that applies to the free accounts. Uh, they also have a Google Apps for Business. I think they call it something else now that, that you pay for. I, I, I use that service. Mm -hmm. do, do you know if the agreement for the paid version is any different, and is it just as vulnerable? I would imagine it's just as vulnerable. I'd have to look at the agreements, and a lot of those agreements might be made specifically for each paid client. It all depends on how Google sets it up. Well, this is, you pay like $5 per month per account. I mean, it's pretty standard uh, fee that they charge. Yeah. I'd, have to, I'd have to look at it, but I can't imagine they're, do, they're saving you a whole lot by charging only $5 a month. Yeah, so, so it seems like there really is no way to honor your MBA and use cloud services at the same time. Um, which there's always that risk. There's always that risk. There's no, you don't know of another solution? Like to, because you, you can't really do your job well. I mean, I, I, it's hard to do your job well without using those services. Um, but, a lot of, but a lot of LSPs will send you links to download the things, the resources security. Yeah. Using those over storing items on the cloud, or on any cloud, or any public cloud, are preferred. So proprietary, because I'm an LSD myself, and one yes. person LSD, so yeah. it's like your uh, private server, I think, it sounds like it's you know, the only alternative. And even that's not foolproof. It's not, nothing is going to be foolproof. If someone wants to break in to your servers, they will. Thank you. Uh, yeah, question. Oh. oh, sorry. The keeper of my So, just a quick follow up on that. Um, if I understood you correctly, the Google agreement applies to all the services, including Gmail. Including Gmail. Essentially, any translation I deliver by email using a Gmail account, meaning I'm violating any NDA assignment. Means you possibly can be. Okay, thank you. Yes. Look what you've been doing. <laughs> In terms of um, the security of a private cloud that you're talking about, mm -hmm. assuming that one could, um, without great expertise, manage to set one up with those mm -hmm. devices, mm -hmm. um, doesn't that leave you open to certain like physical vulnerabilities? So if you have it in your closet and there's a flood, your cloud is also destroyed? Is that, yeah. Is that correct? Okay. It is. I just it does. To make sure I yeah. right. But at this point, it, like it's that, or you could even set it up and have it in some other location, have it at a friend's house. I don't know. Um, and if you can have a couple set up or whatever. But it's all it's all about if you have your information on Amazon or Google or Microsoft, it's a big shiny, it's a big shiny rock on a hill. And this, you're taking your own little pebble and keeping it to yourself. And it's going to be less of a target for hackers. Yes. Uh, who's? Uh, over here. Over here. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Is another one there? I can wait. Go ahead. Do you have a 
um, if that's as far as you know safe? Uh, I'd have to look at Okay, and then Dropbox for business? Again, we'll have to look into it, but Dropbox, it, while it's located on your personal computer, it's also on Dropbox's servers. Yes. Yeah. But it's supposed to be encrypted with a million ways from Sunday. I mean, you said it's government safe, but... Say, Nothing's foolproof. Nothing's foolproof. Yeah. Thing. Nothing. Your per, a personal cloud server, Dropbox for business, anything. Nothing is foolproof and nothing is 100%. I'm going to be secure this way. Except for the pot log cabin. In fact, we should probably start up a commune. So, I just wanted to ask, what's the, in your view, so the best um, middle path to tread here from an ethical perspective? Because I think that a lot of us just sign those NDAs, um, not pay specific attention to this. Uh, do we now, from now on, go back and say, you know, I want to change this, 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 and argue with the, with the agency about what we want to take out because we well, you've already it. signed it, though. Is the thing going is a problem. forward? Or like, how, how do we as translators negotiate that territory of wanting to use NT um, and also wanting to basically work? I guess that's an open question for all my colleagues as well. Yeah, I don't want to. I mean, anything I could tell, I would tell you is a lie, and I'd make it up. I think there's a lot going on where, you know, we know this, yeah. and then we still do it. Yeah, exactly. Well, as an LSE, I mean, if I come up with any reason, she can say she needs to be upset. But how, how can you care to do it now? No, I don't care. You have to trust them. Yeah. Well, what about if they're using their, you know, using Dropbox to store the files? Yeah, so they think that's a good solution to so manage the risk of fires and, you know, working on multiple machines. Dropbox by itself, I wouldn't trust. Dropbox for business, I don't know. It's supposed to be better. But Dropbox itself is very, very well secure. Yeah. And, and so, if you have your own trained engine, then it's just based on your data. And then if you can find out. Well, one vendor has his own memory, and that's fine. Well, yeah, everybody has their own memory. I'm talking about the machine translation. Yeah, no. Trained engine where the vendor makes it for itself. So it's, I don't know. I mean, after listening to this, I don't know. Yeah. So, you know, I sort of that I do my own engine, my own data, and reasonably safe, then that's my sort of um, saving grace because I'm not saving anything to Google or anywhere else. Yeah. It's my own stuff, but I'm still taking advantage of the NT because I don't want to be tied to just TM and then, you know, fuzzy matches over 75%. So, you know, that sort of uh, yeah. is a way of doing it. I know Lyft is a huge player in that market. I don't know if anybody knows that, but they have, you know, an online service where you can send stuff up and you can put your video on the engine and then you can use it. Yeah. So I'm, I'm one of the folks that you mentioned earlier that might need a sleeping pill after, after hearing this. Walgreens is right across the street. Yeah, absolutely. We can go. Let's go together. And so, you know, for those of us that's working in the healthcare field, I have a lot of documents that have really sensitive information. And so if I'm storing this... You, know, you have to be nice to them? Yeah. Okay. Pat them on the back a little. Okay. okay. Um, and in addition to that, um, so, you know, we also have to be HIPAA compliant. And so what are some recommendations um, on how we can um, do what we can um, to, to ensure that these documents remain safe and confidential. Yeah. I mean, the best solution is always to keep it, I mean, I always, I always prefer keeping things on my local, on my local hard drive and everything. And then, and then it, that will also make it keep it HIPAA compliant? No. No, it won't. And, Uh, I actually know the answer to that one. It's uh, file assist, content and multiple devices. It's HIPAA, it's HIPAA, whatever. It's compliant. And it's also compliant with the government standards. Um, 
and then they have another one, another cloud server that kind of can lots of offers. But unfortunately, we need that to start to work. So I'm just help. I'm, I'm just going to help you as a translator. Oh wait, are you a translator or, or an LST? Okay, I'll find out if I can. Oh, what was that? Oh, it's called File Assist, and it's definitely HIPAA compliant, um, and it's an FTP server as well. Okay. Sure, go right ahead. Okay. I'll repeat. Yeah, I've been thinking about these issues for a couple of years and wondering if there's a, since it's been coming up at AT conferences also the last couple of years, um, especially with German clients in my case, all these issues, um, is there any kind of, uh, like a, I'm not even sure what to call it, sort of like some compliance um, process or something or, a checklist or um, some sort of a program that translators could go through to sort of say, I'm doing these, you know, six things to keep your data safe. I could put a little blurb on my information or something that says that I follow certain set of practices or, you know, is there anything like that? I'm not sure what to call it. Exactly. I don't think there's anything in unified like that. If anyone else has an idea, I mean, I mean, I mean or even for knows I mean, I guess because we deal with yeah. so many different things, it's hard to sort of uh, define a process like that. Yeah. It would all, I don't think there's anything unified unless someone else has a better idea. But. Okay, and then that's the specifications. If you want to do that, that's pretty complicated. Yeah. But even, then, yeah, I know. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing was to, um, I was wondering how this sort of, uh, these, these IT security procedures hold up. Oh, sorry. Did you hear the first question? Uh, it was talking about compliance and if there's some sort of a set of procedures or some sort of a standard that we can follow and then say that you know we're compliant with certain data security um, procedures and be able to put that on our translator's information so that clients know that we do certain things. But uh, Joe said there's no sort of unified approach. Not to the best approach. If anyone else knows anything, is it help? I don't know. And then my other question was, a lot, a lot of times it seems like this would be very lopsided. For instance, I have clients that freely send things over email, not FTP and things like that. And if I'm doing, uh, you know, following good practices on my side, does that, in the case of a problem, I would assume that would protect me or help protect me? At that point, it gets to be the, their issue and an issue with project management training, mm -hmm. which, um, is an entirely different project, uh, project, uh, presentation. Um, just to um, go back to your question uh, as to whether there are standards um, mm -hmm. that some professions use, um, I can uh, speak to the standards that the American Bar Association puts out, and some of the bar associations, the state bar associations also, have on their ethical opinions, um, they have standards for uh, maintaining uh, information confidential that uh, serve as guidelines for lawyers. They're not uh, mandatory, uh, but they're strongly encouraged. Um, the problem arises when a um, uh, law firm or a government entity has their own compliance requirements. So even though the lawyer might be following those guidelines that the state bar association puts out or the ABA puts out, the, the, the government entity might have additional standards that, that the attorney may, might not be complying with if they only stick to the ABA or the state bar association requirements. But if you look at the, the, these guidelines that are put out by the ABA and the, um, and the state bar associations, uh, you will see that they're based actually on a reasonable 
um, uh, standard. So you have to follow certain professional and reasonable expectations of what a lawyer is expected to do. Not beyond that. I've been a project manager at, at the localization, in the localization industry. Uh, one of our specialties is certification exams. As you can imagine, that contains the answers to how to become a Microsoft certified whatever, or Cisco, or some microsystems, or whatever it is. Um, so these are very specialized. We, um, things that we do with that, security is critical for this. Uh, I worked at a company for metric many years ago that got sued by Sign Microsystems because one of their exams was leaked, one of the answers, and they spent hundreds of thousands of dollars in each exam. So as a project manager, and what he was saying is absolutely right. As a translator, I recommend this. If you are working with a translation company that you know as a translator, the content should be secure, and the translation company is not taking care of it, don't work with that translation company. Because translation companies have been known to put the blame on the translator um, once they are sued. So just as a word of, word of advice, I would never do that as a PM, had I been a senior PM for many years. Security, if you're a well-trained PM and a good translation company, security will be something important to do. If you're working with a translation company that doesn't care about that, be very careful about who you work with. Just to answer something that was asked here before, Dropbox does encrypt your data in its own servers. It is very good encryption, but they hold the key. It's not end-to-end -end encryption, which means that they encrypt your data, and if somebody steals it, unless they steal the key as well, they can't decrypt. But they will decrypt if the government asks nicely. It has been done before many times. Oh. Thank you, government. <laughs> Uh, what if we uh, ended a bit early and uh, started our own bar association? <laughs> I, I second this. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah, question. No? Could you just put up the first one? Uh, slide to show where we can get slide show. Okay. Thank you very much, and uh, let's go on. Thank you.